This past summer, I was driving around on the electric converted Massey Ferguson tractor, and as I felt the hot sun blazing down on me, I had a thought that I'm sure everyone has had at some point. What if I could somehow trick the sun into powering this tractor? Technically, it's kind of already solar powered, as we often charge it using this trailer mounted array of 12 80 watt panels. The panels connect to this big steel box which contains an MPPD charge controller, AC inverter, and two 48 volt 50 amp hour lithium iron phosphate batteries. Check out that ground connection. This setup works well, but it would be more efficient to put the energy from the solar panels directly into the tractor, passing only through an MPPD charge controller. Right now, the energy gets converted from high voltage DC from the solar panels down to 48 volts for these batteries, then back up to 120 volts AC, into the battery charger, back down to 72 volts DC, and finally into the tractor battery. Also, it would just be way cooler to have a solar roof on the tractor. So I picked up some 225 watt solar panels from a guy on Facebook Marketplace and began figuring out how to mount them on the roof of the tractor, but I immediately ran into a problem because the tractor doesn't actually have a roof. So the first step would be to design one. Because this tractor is so old, it predates safety. Since I have to make a frame to hold the solar panels, I may as well design it to be strong enough to also act as a roll cage. On the front, I can use these mounting points that used to be where the loader attached. On the back, there are some good mounting points holding these rusty fenders on. The bolts were super rusty and really didn't want to come undone. I couldn't find a pipe with a large enough diameter to fit over this wrench, so I had to use the rear tire as a fulcrum to push against, and luckily the wrench didn't turn into a projectile. Well, I don't think I'll be reusing that. Guess I should get an actual hammer. I hope these parts are optional. What? Look at what you're doing. <laughs> That's expected. Oh, okay. For the frame, I settled on some two and a half inch square steel tubing with quarter inch wall thickness. My local metal supplier doesn't charge for cuts, so I decided to give them the privilege of cutting all the pieces to length rather than doing it myself with an angle grinder or a hacksaw. I got these plates of steel, six inches by various numbers of inches. I designed these templates and then printed them out at a one-to-one -one scale so I can simply overlay it over the piece of steel and it gives me the exact locations of all the holes. I designed the frame to use these gussets so that the top bit would be separate from the vertical bits. I could very well have designed it to be completely welded together as one monolithic block of steel, but I think having some parts be separately bolted on will make it a lot easier to assemble and store. The gussets still had to be cut into the desired shape though, which meant it was back to the grinding stone, or rather the grinding disc. Next, I had to drill a bunch of holes in these half inch steel plates, which I was really not excited about. But it turned out my drill press was even less excited, as it decided to literally split in half. Let's be real though, this is well beyond what my little benchtop drill press which I got for basically free and made a video about fixing, link in the bio, is capable of. So I brought the parts back to my friend's farm where there's a much more powerful floor standing drill press. Except, this one went and did the exact same thing. First I tried tapping the chuck back into the taper, but it just fell off again. The problem is that tapers like this are really good at axial loads, but not the sort of erratic side loads that my slightly bent drill subjects it to. So I pulled the chuck off, cleaned all the grease off the mating surfaces, put on a bit of red Loctite, and then tapped it back on. And just to give it the best possible chance of not coming off, I used a jack to press it on and then left the jack in place for a few days while the Loctite cured. When I came back, I was able to successfully drill all the holes, and thank god because I was this close to blowing the entire year's Patreon budget on a magnetic drill. Once I had all these pieces cut and drilled, I could weld the mounting plates to the ends of the vertical supports. My little flux core welder would have been pretty underpowered for this, so I borrowed my friend's fancy multi-process welder. After using this welder, it's going to be very hard going back to using my one. With the vertical supports now fabricated, I could now awkwardly attempt to bolt them to the tractor. The store didn't have the exact length of bolts I needed, and some of these are blind holes, so I had to shorten a few of the bolts by about half an inch or 13 millimeters. However, when you cut a bolt, especially with a hacksaw, it tends to mess up the threads at the end. To fix this, I used my lathe to add a chamfer to each bolt. Then I discovered that for some reason these holes are smaller than I remembered. I could have sworn they were 3 quarter inch diameter holes, but now they're only 5 eighths. The only possible explanation is that it was warmer out when I measured the first time and now the steel has shrunk. Either way, I don't want to buy new bolts, so I have to enlarge these holes. And I left my cordless drill at home, so I'm stuck using the Wrist Breaker 2000. <laughs> 
Okay, the vertical supports are in place. Now it's time to make the rectangular frame that will hold the solar panels. Turns out I mismeasured the length for these steel angle pieces, so I had to cut about 5 inches off using the abrasive chop saw. This is the second worst saw I've ever used. The worst saw I've ever used is this. There's a tiny gap over there, about a quarter of an inch or six millimeters that I need to close up. So I've done all the horizontal bits, now I need to do the vertical bits, but I'd rather avoid having to weld vertically because the molten metal tends to droop down and it's kind of difficult, so I'd rather avoid it if I can, and in this case I can. I just have to flip the entire apparatus up on one end, which is easier said than done. With that done, it's time to put the big metal rectangle on top of the tractor. At one point it was looking like it didn't want to go up there, but luckily it changed its mind on that one. Then I positioned it so that it was centered, clamped it down, and began drilling the holes to bolt it in place. I chose not to drill these holes ahead of time because drilling the whole assembly in place makes sure that all the holes will line up perfectly. And because you guys are always telling me to use cutting oil when drilling, even though I already do, here's the proof. Now it was finally time to install the solar panels. So after getting all suited up in my fall restraint system, otherwise known as just balancing good, I dragged all four panels into place. Then I had the unpleasant task of overhead drilling about 24 holes through the steel angle and into the aluminum frames of the solar panels, followed by bolting all the solar panels down. And now for something completely different. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB. Over the past few years, I've ordered hundreds of boards from JLC, and I use them in nearly every project I build, including the electric tractor. You probably already know you can get two layer boards starting from just $2, but you can also get six layer boards starting from $33 with a coupon, and they include capped via in pad and gold enig surface plating. Now you might be wondering, what's so great about via in pad? Why can't I just put the vias next to the pad? Well here's a power board I'm working on. If I didn't put vias under the MOSFETs, all the heat would have to escape through the top layer before it could be spread to inner layers. With via in pad, I can put vias directly under the part, pulling the heat straight out from the source. It also helps when routing high density BGA packages, or anytime you're working under tight space constraints. Six layers just make everything cleaner and easier. I've dealt with a lot of PCB manufacturers, so trust me when I say getting all of this for $33 is a steal. Just a few years ago, boards like these were completely out of reach for hobbyists. Get this offer using the link in the description, and thanks to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. Alright, back to the tractor. Now you might think the next step is to connect all the solar panels to a charge controller and then connect that to the battery. And that would be correct, if you wanted it to suck, you see, this battery I built for the tractor just isn't cutting it for me. It was a good start, but I'm finding that the BMS will just sometimes randomly shut off, which is annoying at best and kinda dangerous at worst, and the whole battery just isn't really big enough. I used 20 lithium ion cells in series to form a 72 volt battery, but the capacity is only 42 amp hours, which means this whole thing is only about 3 kilowatt hours. So I bought this new battery from a friend, and it's an absolute unit which I can barely even move. The battery, that is, not the friend. Despite being barely two times the size of the red battery, it has more than five times the capacity. It's also made with 20 cells in series, but these are lithium iron phosphate cells, so the nominal cell voltage is 3.3 volts, putting the total voltage at about 66 volts. That's slightly less voltage than the original battery, but the capacity of this one is 230 amp hours, putting the total energy stored at a whopping 15 kilowatt hours. It's also a lot more waterproof thanks to the welded enclosure and this overhanging lid, plus I added a bead of RTV gasket maker for double protection. There are so many different kinds of RTV silicone in the stores, so you might be wondering how I know this is the right stuff. Well, this battery also has a higher quality BMS, which is actually rated for a few hundred amps, so I don't need a contactor, and since these are LFP cells, I can charge them to 100%. In a previous video, when I mentioned that I was only charging the red battery to 80%, people rushed to the comments to tell me, you don't have to do that, LFP cells can be fully charged. And it's like, yeah, I know, but those weren't LFP cells. But now, these are LFP cells. 
Since the terminals on the battery are more spread out, I had to extend the power cables. I decided to add this gigantic Anderson connector so that the battery could be disconnected since it doesn't have a power button and is just always live. I used my hydraulic crimper to put some ring terminals on one end and the Anderson connector on the other end. And then I sealed it all up with some adhesive lined heat shrink tubing. Then with my safety squints engaged, I plugged the battery into the tractor and miraculously no explosion or fire, that's good. And even better, everything actually still worked. This new battery is a bit longer than the original, so I made some tabs to give me a place to bolt it down. I ordered four of these step-up charge controllers, but I only received one step-up controller and three step-down controllers. On one hand, it's annoying that I didn't receive what I ordered, but I do blame myself a little since the seller is literally called Buy a Turd. I went with these specific controllers because I want each panel to have its own controller to minimize the impact if one panel is partially shaded. This means that the controllers need to be able to boost the voltage from the panels, as the panels only produce about 30 volts, and this is a 66 volt battery. It's a lot more common to wire a whole bunch of panels in series, which results in a pretty high voltage, and then use a controller that drops the voltage down to whatever the batteries need. So I've constrain myself to the rather limited selection of boost controllers on the market. Since I plan to house these controllers in a waterproof box without any airflow, I decided to mount them on a quarter inch thick aluminum plate which I cut down to size on my table saw. The controllers themselves were a tight fit so I gave them each a slight trim as well. The box came with this plastic mounting plate which I used to mark the hole locations on the aluminum plate and then I drilled and tapped a bunch of holes to mount everything to this plate. I'm using these cable gland things to help create a waterproof seal where the wires enter the box, and I've intentionally placed all the entry points on the bottom to minimize water ingress. Then I wired everything up, which I know isn't the most exciting thing to watch, Next I needed to measure the length of wire to go from the box to the battery, so I plugged the Anderson connector in to hold it in place, stretched out the cable, and then... That's probably pretty high on the list of the dumbest things I've done all year. Somehow it didn't occur to me that plugging the wire in would make it live, so when I cut the wire, it shorted the battery pack through my wire cutters, leaving soot all over my thumb and vaporizing a chunk of the cutters. Surprisingly, the 500 amp fuse didn't blow. I guess the short circuit was brief enough, and the resistance of the 12 gauge wire limited the current somewhat. Anyway, I finished wiring the battery to the box, then hooked up two of the four solar panels to their respective charge controllers. I'm using Wago connectors for now, but that's just temporary. Although, in my personal experience, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution that works. Now I can test the solar panels outside, but unfortunately, time did that annoying thing where it passes, and suddenly, now it's winter. Where I live, that means all we get is a depression-inducing free trials worth of sunshine for what barely feels like an hour a day, and that's if we're lucky and the skies are clear. Right now, each solar panel is producing 66.4 volts and 0.3 amps, which works out to 20 watts per panel. I've only hooked up two panels at the moment, but if I had all four connected we'd be getting about 80 watts. Technically a non-zero value, but still pretty unimpressive. But every day isn't an overcast day in December, so let's find some averages. There's this website called PV Watts, which lets you enter your location and solar array details, and it will tell you how much energy to expect each month. Apparently, with this 900 watt array mounted completely flat, I can expect to get 30 kilowatt hours total for the entire month of December. When carrying a pallet of firewood, this tractor uses about 50 amps at 64 volts, which works out to 3.2 kilowatts. So we'll get enough solar energy for just under 10 hours of use for the entire month. But here's the sad truth. In the winter, nobody actually wants to use this tractor because it doesn't have a heated cab. Not only does the electric tractor not have a heated cab, it doesn't even have a cab. Personally, I think the cool factor of a solar powered electric tractor outweighs such opulent luxuries as heat and shelter, but to each their own. In the summer, it's a totally different story. The non-functional air conditioning turns those enclosed cabs on the diesel tractors into miniature greenhouses, so the open cab becomes a much more compelling choice. Energy-wise, in July, we'll get 150 kilowatt hours of solar energy, which gives us about 47 hours of use for the
for the month. That's enough for about an hour and a half of driving per day, including weekends, which is adequate for the intended use of this tractor. And that's just the free energy from the solar roof. If we supplement that with charging from the solar trailer, we can roughly double the drive time since the solar trailer produces roughly the same amount of energy as the roof. And if we really push it and use the entire battery's worth of energy in a day, which would require grid charging if we wanted to do that every day, then we would get a drive time of about four and a half hours. If you think that's still not enough, well, I don't envy your equipment, and this probably isn't the tractor for you. But at the end of the day, it's not even for sale, so I don't need to hear it. But go ahead and leave your comments anyway, it boosts engagement. I was hoping to have this finished by summer so I could show it running at full power, but I didn't quite get there in time. Rather than waiting another six months to post this, I figured I'd put it out as is, and I'll do a follow-up in the summer. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe, and huge thanks to everybody supporting me on Patreon. If you become a supporter, you'll get early access to videos, bonus content, and sometimes I even mail out cool stickers that are perfect for sticking on things. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Look, there's a fossilized cotter pin that was crushed between the thing when it was assembled.